Don Jr. appears in court and testifies. They say with a big smile on his face, we know Tish James has been sitting there in the back of the courtroom, not even at the attorney's table, kind of back where all the other, you know, public sits. And so she's sitting back there, which is strange because she's the state attorney general. And Don Jr. walks right in and just drops a big smile because he was her witness. And he smiles as he says, I don't know anything about accounting. I don't know anything about valuation, but I'm here because you subpoenaed me, Tish. So we're going to go through the trial proceedings, of course, as we know. The people who keep telling us they care about transparency and accountability and openness have closed, locked down this state courtroom. It's not a federal court, so they could easily open it up, I'm sure. But they've chosen not to, so that this whole clown show can happen behind closed doors. But to dig into this, we're going to start by going over to Adam Klasfeld's X account, where he has been live tweeting portions of this trial, and he was there all day today. And here is what he says what happened. And he's going to tell us, good morning, when the civil fraud trial began, began connecting us back to the openings. New York Attorney General's counsel, so Tish's other lawyers, not Tish, don't ever think she's doing anything, played this video deposition of Donald Trump. Now Trump is expected, Junior, let me be clear, Trump Junior is expected to take the stand later on in the day and he's going to be live tweeting this. Now I wanted to just play this to give us a flavor, right? We don't get to see inside the courtroom and so this is kind of how Don Junior shows up and testifies. This was on July 28, 2022, so over two years ago, over a year ago, and he is kind of doing the same thing here. Okay. It's kind of the same shtick. It's kind of, I don't really know anything. I went to Wharton and so on and so forth. And so we'll probably get a same flavor of this when he does testify. We do have a couple witnesses before he comes into the queue, but we'll get through those quickly and then get right to Don Jr. So this is what um, he sounded like. Earned your BS in, in economics from Wharton. Do you have any familiarity with an acronym GAAP? G-A-A-P? Generally accepted accounting principles, yes. Okay. How did you become familiar with that acronym? Probably in Accounting 101 at Wharton. Okay. Okay. What do they teach you about generally accepted accounting principles in Wharton? Well, I'm not an accountant, but that they are generally accepted. Principles, probably. Anything else? That's pretty much what I remember from Accounting 101. <laughs> so. Have you told me everything you know about GAP? <laughs> Basically. You know, I'm sure I could come up with some creative <laughs> stuff to kill time, but I'd be doing neither of us a favor in terms of educating ourselves. Thank you. So, I have fair to say you've never been employed in a position that required you to apply GAP to your work? No, not that I'm aware of. All right, so that kind of style, that kind of flavor is what we'll get into, but there were other witnesses that came before the stand, and we jump right into the trial activities, courtesy of Adam Klasfeld. You can follow him, which I would encourage you to do, at Klasfeld Report on the X and he's reporting over for the messenger does good work. So let's dig into it. He says trials in session. Everybody's moseying around on their phone, talking to each other, blah, 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 blah sports, uh, you know, diamondbacks, whatever. And then they say, all rise. Oh, sh quiet. Put your phone down. Okay. All right. So please be seated. <clears throat> all right. We're back on the record. The case is big Tish, Letitia James against Donald Trump and everybody who is on his side. We got recall to the stand or call to the stand. David Orowitz, Tish's other attorneys who are actually doing all the work here says who was Trump's, this was Trump's senior vice Vice President of Acquisitions and Development. So David Horowitz on the stand. So they say, all right, Mr. Horowitz, good morning. My name is Eric Heron. I am here with Tish's office. I want to show you an email that you wrote to Alan Weisselberg. And we know Alan Weisselberg was the CFO of the Trump Organization, the chief financial officer, kind of the head guy in charge of all this financial stuff. So he sends this email. He says, it looks like you sent this one on December 16, 2011. You remember that? He says, oh, vaguely, let me show you. Okay, let's talk through it. They say, okay, here's what it says. Subject, important. From the witness, an email, the witness on the stand to Alan Weisselberg, the CFO. Important. Need to discuss now is the subject. Oh, sounds ominous. December 16th, 2011, nearing the end of the year. They say, hey, Alan, Ivanka wanted me to change the language in the gap section. The gap section GAAP, the same thing that Trump Jr. referenced, Don Jr. She asked that I review with you, Alan. So then the attorney shows the witness another email. He says, you remember that? He says, yeah, that sounds right. I want to show you another email. Now this time, this one came from Deutsche Bank and, and it came from Rosemary Verablik to Ivanka Trump. And this one's dated just a couple, well, significantly later, a significant difference. So 2011, now we fast forward all the way to 2016, five years later. I want to show you another email. The subject of this one is called Doral. So this email 
email Deutsche Banks's Rosemary to Ivanka. So this guy's not even on this email, apparently. We'll see. He says, now I spoke to the credit team on the $50 million request and we are thrilled to consider it for you. He says, okay, that looks like an email. Apparently he has seen the email. Maybe he's on the chain. Maybe it came across his desk. Do you recognize it? This witness identifies this email. Ivanka Trump said something. I spoke to the credit team. She gets an email. Somebody says, I spoke to the credit team. You got a $50 million request under consideration. All right. All right we'll see where that goes. Doesn't seem really important, but we'll see. So brief direct examination ends. Okay, that's it. No further questions. Hey, Trump's team, anything from you guys? <laughs> no, no questions. No cross-examination at all. That's easy. Out of the way. Okay, next witness, the government, Tishy, your honor, on behalf of Tish's office, New York, we call Michael McCarty. And who's this guy? Great. He's the state's expert witness. So now he is going to come out here and he expects to tabulate how much the defendants may have to pay in disgorgement. Okay, so this is a damages guy. He's going to come out and say, you know, Trump ripped off the people of New York. However, I don't know, you know how exactly we'll see. And he needs to lose hundreds of millions of dollars in order to make this whole. And they say, well, what's your background, Mr. Expert? And we have seen a lot of experts come out and have new opinions about Trump. They say, what's your background, sir? And so McCarty says, the guy on the stand, well, I happen to be pretty dang smart. I'm the chairman and the CEO of the investment bank called M.M. Dillon & Co. Wow, it sounds fancy. So his testimony begins. He says, oh, I'm super qualified, blah, blah, blah. This, you know, level six, series six. Series 7, Series 37, whatever. I'm a financial blah, blah, blah. He goes through all that. So then we fast forward through that. Nobody cares. After all that garbage, the questioning turns over to McCarty's expert report because he's an expert. So the first category, he says, can you walk us through your report since you're so qualified? He says, I'd love to. What's the first category on your report here that you typed up your book report? Well, let me walk you through it. Tish's lawyer. He says, well, you know, he says, first of all, I go through a series of loans where Trump said that everyone made money on the loans at issue in the case. In other words, Trump is saying there's no victims here because all these loans, every Everybody made money. We paid the loans on times, blah, blah, blah. But he says, but banks gave Trump favorable terms based on statements of financial conditions that this judge in this case is already determined to be fraudulent, right? And the judge has already done that. We're actually in the damages portion of this, essentially. But the judge has already said there is fraud. But how much fraud? We'll see. So the financial condition currently is that those things were based on fraud. So in other words, the fact that they made money on it doesn't negate the fraud, I think is where this will go. Let's see. The New York Attorney General Counsel, so Tish's law lawyer. She says, well, I want to explain this, walk through this concept with you. You've read the orders in this case, haven't you, as an expert? Yeah. And I want to recall your attention to this footnote, footnote 21, from the judge's ruling before this trial, where the judge ordered the dissolution of Trump's corporate entities. So I guess he's going to be explaining the footnote for us in this judge's courtroom for whatever reason. So they pull up this document and says, hey, the subject loans made the banks lots of money, but the fraudulent SFCs cost the banks lots lots of money. The less collateral for a loan, the riskier it is. And a first principle of loan accounting is that as risk rises, so do interest rates. Thus, accurate SFCs would have allowed the lenders to make even more money than they did. So Trump is kind of taking an opportunity away from them, the opportunity cost, or if he would have been honest with them, they would have made more. So that's what he says. And the expert is now referencing that, which came from the judge. Footnote from the judge's ruling. And he says, well, do you understand that? And I guess the judge is probably really happy that he's reading his words back to him and open court. It's like, wow, that's really great writing. I love what I did there. So then they tell us, well, thank you for reading that. And you would agree with that principle since you're an expert, you would agree that if you do it that way, that there is fraud, that actually is a harm. So even though they made money, they actually were the victim of this. And he would say, yes, definitely. We were the victim and it costs us things and whatever, right? What, I probably had a whole answer. He says, well, what I did here is I actually did some analysis on this. Incredible. He says, I conducted an analysis of risk differentials of what the true interest rates would have been if the statements of financial condition accurately stated Trump's assets. Now, with that preamble, the council puts an exhibit on the screen. It says lost interest calculation. They go through a bunch of spreadsheets. Everyone's eyes glaze over in the courtroom. Grand total of lost interest. Oh my gosh, $168 million that Trump should have paid if he would have been arranged at the appropriate interest rate in terms of loans. So this is broken down. He says broken into these different categories on the screen. Doral, old post office, Chicago. 40 Wall Street. So he's gone through and he's with a fine tooth comb sort of analyzed it and said, you know, they got a 2%. It should have been a 4%. So questioning investigates what went into that. And they're just showing one category. This is one exhibit of the report and they're just showing one category. So it's like going to be a lot, I think is where Adam has taken us. He says, now Chris Keese, Trump's defense attorney, he objects. Your Honor, I object to this testimony. First of all, how can these be considered ill-gotten gains under the law for the purposes of disgorgement, absent testimony that the bank's wouldn't have otherwise
otherwise authorize the loans. So in other words, the banks made the judgment that this was favorable to them and the terms were good enough that they made money. So the banks didn't lose any money. So how were those ill-gotten gains, and that's in quotes, right? So that's gonna be the term of art that they're using in the court. How could these be ill-gotten gains that authorized disgorgement if the banks were satisfied and actually approved and ultimately profited from the loans? Maybe they didn't profit as much, but they definitely profited and so it's not ill-gotten, right? It doesn't fall within the term of art. So Angeron says, overruled, please quiet down again, sit back down. So he sits down, he says, well, you can cross-examine him about that if you want to, and you can make your closing arguments there, but we're gonna let this testimony continue. Kiss jumps back up, he says, judge, Tish's office, they're asking this witness to substitute his judgment with what was negotiated between the parties. This guy's not a banker, and this guy's not on Trump's team. So he can't make a decision based on what he thinks and speculates because he's not in their seat. And so we can't play this game here. It's all speculative. It doesn't fit within the confines of the law. And we object. Angeron says, overrule. <laughs> nice try. With that, the judge says, we're going to break. So we fast forward through the break and we're back. Now, they say, the judge says, all right, look, how much longer is this going to take? We got Trump Jr. coming in here. Don Jr. is going to be here any minute. And the attorney says, well, we're going to be done here pretty soon. We're going to just submit all this. The judge is just going to buy it. So whatever. He says, we're going to finish our direct in five to 10 minutes. And Trump's lawyer says, oh, five to 10 minutes. Now, guess what? Our cross-examination is going to be up to three hours, says Christopher Keyes. Man, he brought a binder bigger than Kareem Jean-Pierre's out there, and he's just going to read from top to bottom. Now, we'll see. Now, they're all wondering whether this is going to really take three hours. The defense attorneys might just be bluffing. Let's see. So, direct examination ends. Not much more out of the guy. He's an expert. His spreadsheets are all, you know, available. And then Trump's lawyers come up for cross. Jesus Suarez in the house for Trump's defense. Shout out to Jesus. He's up doing cross-examination of this expert witness. Now, this is the chart that they put up on the screen, and you can see what we're looking at. 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, up to 23, and he's got all the different properties in the various rows. So the Doral property, the OPO property, the Chicago property, and 40 Wall Street. Then he says, okay, yeah, the Delta, it's just the actual interest rate, the supposed interest rate, maybe that it should have been, the term of the loan, the loan amount, the interest Delta. So if the bank would have charged him a higher interest rate, they would have made more money. In 2014, on the Doral property, they would have made 4.7 million bucks more. 2015, 10 million bucks, and so on. And then that totals to 72 mil. OPO, 53 mil. Chicago, 17 mil. And 40 Wall Street, 24 mil for a total. 168 mil that apparently the banks lost because they didn't get it, even though they did profit and they agreed to the terms and the terms were fine. They got paid. So this guy is substituting his judgment which is just, you know, basically what they do all the time. Liz Cheney wants to substitute Trump's judgment for her judgment, even though she's not even in office anymore, right? This is just kind of the pattern. So they take a lunch break. And now we're trying to see if there's going to be a strong cross-examination. Witness is back on the stand. Trump's attorney hops back up. Jesus is back at the podium. He says, Your Honor, he says, a Deutsche Bank witness testified that the bank was not misled. Isn't that true, McCarty? That a witness from the bank said that they were not misled. Tisha office, her persecutors, they jump up and say, objection, misstates the testimony. That's not what that witness said. McCarty, he responds. He said, well, the Deutsche witness testimony, it wouldn't have been material to my analysis. So I don't really have any opinion on that. I did my analysis regardless of their opinion. And so this three hour cross-examination is over. One question, done. Your honor, I have no further questions on this cross-examination. We're done with this guy. No redirect from the government and that's it. And now, guess who's here? Don Jr. enters the courtroom, and we're still sticking here with Klasfeld. Klasfeld reports on the X, continues. He tells us, Don Jr. walks in, they open the doors, they say, witness entering, he walks in, sits down at the defense table, photographers and videographers taking photographs, recording him, he's flanked by his attorneys, he quips, I should have worn makeup. Oh. Now, meanwhile, Ivanka Trump and her lawyers are also trying to appeal a subpoena that she has to testify, and so then Tish's lawyers hop on up for their direct examination. Remember, Don Jr. has been called by Tish, not by the defense, and subpoenaed to be there. They didn't want to be here. So the actual person who's doing substantive work on this case, who's not named Letitia, is named Colleen, and her last name is Faherty. And so they go into Trump Jr.'s life and education, right? Where are you from? You know, Donald Trump's kid. That's why my last name is Junior, if you didn't know. And they walk through his education, Wharton Finance, blah, 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 business school. You're a smart guy, right? Yeah, I'm smart. Now, Don Jr., just like we heard previously at the top of this
this segment. Are you familiar with the acronym GAAP, also known as GAP? They have a back and forth. He says, well, you know, it's a complicated thing. I'm not an accountant. I do, you know, politics with my dad now, blah, blah, blah. But I do know what it stands for, okay? And she says, just give me an answer. He says, okay, look, it's generally accepted accounting principles. But he says, beyond that, that's what I have CPAs for, okay? The smart people handle these questions. But that's nice that you have that help. But I need to ask you, Don Jr., did you receive professional training related to GAP? He says, no, I didn't. He says, okay, so no professional training, no. So who's your employer right now? You're employed, aren't you? Yeah. Who's your official employer? He says, well, I believe it's still Trump Payroll Corps. Now, are you familiar with another concept in the law called the Rent Stabilization Law? Don Jr. says, I was then, but I probably forgot most of it now. Well, I want to ask you about a series of emails and conversations and things that you had with Alan Weisselberg, the same CFO, now an ex-CFO from the Trump Organization, who's already convicted of tax fraud. They said, Don Jr., after Donald Trump's, your dad's, inauguration in January 2017, you said that the decision-making authority of your organization, you said, quote, that it shifted to, quote, Alan Weisselberg, myself, and my brother, referring to Eric Trump. Isn't that true? Yeah, I believe I did say that. And I want to ask you about the timing of Alan Weisselberg's departure, because you said that authority just shifted over to Alan, so now I want to see what happened when Alan left. So, at what point did Alan Weisselberg not have have the capability, the same decision-making authorities that he had previously after the inauguration. He says, oh, well, we removed Alan Weisselberg after his indictment, but I don't know when that happened. So Alan Weisselberg had decision-making power. Tish James indicts him, or I think maybe it was the previous New York AG. Trump has to move him off the board because he's under criminal indictment now. So they say, Don Jr., you don't know when he left? No. Did you ask him to leave? Was it you who did the asking? No, I did not. Did your brother ask him to leave? I'm not sure. Judge Angeron is like, I'm getting tired here, okay? Let's take an afternoon break. He says, as usual, let's take a 10 minute break, which will end in 15 minutes. Oh, judge, hilarious. What a fun show. What a fun joke of a trial this is. So they take their 15 minute breaks, probably 20 minutes breaks. You know how they work. Says, as we return, Angeron is quizzing Trump Jr. about a question on his mind. So Don Jr. sitting on the bench and Judge Angeron looks over at him. He says, hey, Don Jr., while you're here, I got a question for you. He's like, yeah, judge, what do you want? You're wrecking everything. Thanks. What's up? How can I help you? How does one pronounce the revocable in the Donald J. Trump revocable trust? Is it revocable or revocable? Is it revocable or is it revocable? He says, judge, I have no idea. Okay, I don't know. Call it whatever the hell you want. I don't know how he said it, but there's laughter in the courtroom. And Faherty, the New York attorney general lawyer who's not Tish, she says, this is riveting. Do you know why? Because they have have no personalities at all. That's why. All right. They just don't even, they're like walking monotone robots who just want to prosecute their political enemies. That's it. So even the judge and Don Jr. are kind of laughing it up in the AG's office is like riveting. Can we get back to our scam show trial here, please? You two get a room. Unbelievable. So he says, is it revocable or revocable? The Donald J. Trump revocable trust or the revocable trust? Who knows? Pick your poison. Go with it. So Faye Herdy says, I'm going with revocable. All right. So now they're getting into this prelude to questioning about Trump Jr.'s acceptance of his position as a trustee. All right. So now they go into it. Faherty says, I'm going to call it revocable. Trump's revocable trust. And I want to ask you about this trust. There's something happening around the election. Father's inauguration says, yeah. And they're also asking about Weisselberg and when he resigned. Don Jr., do you know when he resigned? No. If I told you it was June 2021, would you believe me? Sure. Well, I want to show you a document that President Trump himself signed. Do you remember this document dated January 15th, 2021? Maybe. Let me see it. Okay. Yeah, I recollect that. Okay. And here, restored himself. And what does it say there? So you'd agree with me that President Trump restored himself as a trustee on January 15th, 2021. Yeah, that looks right. Now, what about Eric Trump? Was he ever a trustee over the trust? I don't think he was, says Don Jr. Questioning shifts. Now we're talking about compensation. Says, well, you're getting paid by Trump Corp payroll, as you mentioned earlier in this direct examination. But how much compensation do you and your sister siblings received when you bought licensing deals. I want to ask you some questions about that. He says, well, the way it would work is we have a name and we do deals and we would get a cut of what they drew in. And so I'd go out and generate deals and license this and license that Trump, Trump, Trump. And we do vodka. We do steaks. We do blah, blah. And then the company TTT consulting would be managing it all. And we'd all just take a cut of it, right? We'd all just kind of split in 20% of that deal, 50% of that deal, whatever. So I want to talk about a couple of these deals that you've been working on. Some of these were international deals, weren't they, Don? He says, oh yeah, we're all over the world, baby. It's Trump International.
international. Who do you think you're talking to? So says, well, what about this one in Baku, Azerbaijan, Dubai, UAE, Vancouver, Canada? Trump's lawyer stands up. The heck is this, Your Honor? Objection. This is irrelevant. Where is this going? And Angeron's kind of like, yeah, you know, I kind of like Don Jr. now, but he's not ruling. It seems like he kind of agrees. He's like, yeah, Don Jr. liked my joke about revocable. I kind of like this guy. And so Fayard, he says, hold on, judge, before you rule, this is where I'm going. All right. I'm asking him about these business deals because some of his international deals on this spreadsheet weren't reflected in the statements. Okay. We're getting to inconsistencies in the statements. And Judge Angeron says, well, I'll allow it, but we'll get back to it tomorrow, says the judge. And Adam Klasfeld will be here tomorrow when Eric Trump is back. And Eric Trump will be apparently back tomorrow for testimony as well. And so a great report from Adam Klasfeld. Now I want to double up on this and take a look at what our friend Dan Alexander also said about this because he's been live tweeting this as well. And it looks like they might've wrapped up a little bit earlier, but this is a similar take from Dan Alexander. He's writing over for Forbes and he's also on the X platform. So just to fill in some of the gaps, we have Donald Trump Jr. now on the stand. He walks into the courtroom. Judge Angeron, as the photographers are rushing in, says, I believe we got some photographers that are interested in the situation. Of course, Don says, I should have worn makeup. Takes up the stand, says, I do. He's seated. Questioning starts. Attorney General asks him, hey, Don, are you taking any medication or any drugs of any kind? He says, no. The office is going into his qualifications. Boom, they talk about the gap. Nope, that's what I've got. CPAs for. Now, this is where he smiles broadly, my friends. The Attorney General asks several similar questions about accounting certifications and other things. And at one point, Don Jr. says, quote, I have no understanding. And he smiles big for the camera, smiles broadly. Laughter bubbles up in the courtroom. I'm sure Tish didn't like that one. She's sitting there scrimming in her seat. So then Trump Jr. starts this day fired up. And of course, we'll get there, saying that this fake case should be dismissed and also goes after Judge Angeron, saying, leave my children alone. This was his true social post. Oh, this is different. He said Trump was posting about this on truth. This fake case should be dismissed. He posts on truth. Then he goes after Judge Angeron saying, leave my children alone, Angeron. You are a disgrace to the legal profession. Trump posts, Judge Angeron is a political hack that ruled against me before my trial even started. My financial statements are great. And there was no fraud. Don Jr. walks into the courtroom, witness entering. And so that was actually earlier. So that was earlier. And so we're caught up to speed and laughter in the courtroom. And so that's my friend is what happened on the day. And so we had an interesting session with Don Jr. Now he'll be back in court tomorrow. And then if they wrap up with him, we'll have some cross-examination from Trump's defense. We'll have Eric Trump then also coming in. And then we've got Ivanka potentially coming up and others. So it is going to be a lot of road ahead. We'll be here continuing to cover it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for subscribing to this channel and for sharing it with a friend or family member. You know, one of the things I think that they're doing is not allowing cameras in the courtroom so that we can't see how ridiculous this all is. So we're appreciative to Adam Klasfeld, to Dan Alexander, and to the people who are in the courtrooms for reporting on what's happening there. And we appreciate you sharing our work to those who need to see the truth about what's happening to Trump and the Trump family in this case and more. We'll continue to cover my friends. We'll see you at robertgovea.com where you can sign up for our daily newsletter and we'll look forward to seeing you there and on the next one. Thank you.